It's a great pleasure to have you all for another um, EPFL CIS and Recon AIP machine learning and AI talks. Today, we have Hidedoshi Shimo Daira Sensei uh, from Kyoto University, who's also a department chair. Uh, he's been working on the theory and methods for statistics and machine learning. And uh, his actually covariate shift work um, is quite popular. I can also attest to that one. Um, uh, and he has this multi scale bootstrap method that is used in genomics for evaluating the statistical significance of trees and clusters. And I guess today we will hear more about this. Take it away, uh, Shimodaira Sensei. Yes, thank you very much for a uh, nice introduction. Yes, I appreciate it. So today I want to talk about uh, this uh, topic, which is uh, more like, uh, you know, uh, statistics instead of uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence. And recently, uh, our lab is more like more focusing on, you know, uh, neural networks and natural language uh, processing and what embeddings. But uh, today I just uh, chose more, uh, you know, traditional uh, topic in statistics. And this is also my favorite. So this is kind of outline so first uh, we i show some introduction and then example and so but uh, i have a a large amount of theory part but uh, you know so there are a lot of slides for here but uh, just i thinking i will just skip it so okay so i try to explain the background and set up more work here. Okay. So first let me show the kind of motivation of selective inference. So in uh, traditional statistics, you might have been told by, by te textbooks, like uh, you have to prepare a hypothesis, you know, and then after you have set up after that, you may collect the uh, data and compute, uh, say, p-value or applying the statistical method to data, then report the result. Then may you reject a hypothesis or not reject or accept or something like that. So this is the traditional setup, but uh, in reality, you usually or you may do that, you know, well, you may set up hypothesis and then data collection, but uh, on the final step, if you don't have a significant result, you know, p-value is larger than 5%, then you are not to be able to have a publication, you know, the well-known journal like uh, Nature or Science may not accept your uh, result if the p-value is not significant, okay? So you may just uh, throw away the result, uh, non-significant result. Or some people may do even p-hacking, like, uh, you know, instead of uh, setting up hypothesis, you may first collect the data and then explore a hypothesis for which you have a nice result. You know, and then of course, again, discard a p-value uh, larger than 5% report report only no significant one. So if you do that kind of thing, then you may usually get the inflated uh, significance. That means more false positive than expected, okay? So you easily have uh, publications, but uh, that eventually, you know, you got the wrong result, many of wrong results, you know, in journals. So that's a kind of motivation. So we have to do some something, <laughs> okay, to adjust the p-value or you just don't do this kind of thing. But if you want to do that, you have to adjust the uh, uh, p-value. Then the idea is conditional inference. That means we do uh, construct the p-value so that uh, the type one error is, you know, uh, controlled under the condition on the condition that uh, you 
got a, a kind of significant result or something like that. Okay. And this has been uh, you know, discussed for a long time, probably. This is uh, known as a file drawer problem. You know, uh, you know that non-significant results are maybe thrown away in the file drawer, and then not on the publication. And so recently, uh, some people have been developed, uh, you know, method methodology uh, called selective inference. This is a conditional inference. Okay, so this is a kind of nice uh, introduction paper. So let me uh, explain a very, uh, very naive example. Okay, so C X is just a real uh, variable, a random variable. Uh, normally distributed with, uh, ah, I just make a mistake. This slide I made a little bit ago. Okay, so this is here mu and the variance one, just this is total, you know, sorry. So normally distributed with mean mu and then variance one, just this wrong. Okay, and then now hypothesis here is uh, mu is equal to zero or uh, less than zero. So this is null hypothesis. And then I would like to test this null hypothesis against uh, uh, this alternative. Then the p-value is, you know, like this defined like this. Um, and then this probability is computed uh, under the, under the null, kind of null hypothesis, boundary of the, these two hypotheses, which is uh, mu equals zero, okay? Then p value is computed like this. Uh, this function is the cumulative distribution function of uh, the normal, the standard normal. Okay, so I would like to do uh, x is larger than this specified x, so just I have to one minus CDF, CDF. Okay, and I define this as a bar of pi. And just as pretend you got uh, x equals three, then p value may be computed like that. So this is highly significant. Okay, but uh, what if we test the uh, hypothesis only when x is large enough, like uh, selecting the hypothesis? So, you know, for example, you discard the result if x is smaller than two, and then only test, test your hypothesis only when x is larger than two, for example, okay? Then this is kind of answer, but uh, let me show the example first. So uh, this is very naive. So maybe I maybe speed up here. So, so this is what I said here. The p value is the area for here. So if you observe, for example, x equals one, then here is one, then p value is here, okay? If you observe x equals three, then the p value is maybe here, something like that. Then this is computed like, uh, you know, if x equals one, then p value is 15, about 15%. X equals three is about uh, zero point one percent, uh, something like that. Okay. And check by simulation. So if you generate uh, ten thousand, ten thousand data, ten thousand x, and then compute the p value for each of x, and then got the histogram, then you know under the null hypothesis mu equals zero, uh, and that hypothesis p is distributed, you know, uniform between zero and one. So this is what we expect, okay? So everything working fine, okay? And then the, just uh, specify alpha, you know, significant level equals say 1%, then, you know, I just skip here. And then probability that the P value is smaller than alpha is almost 1%, you know, this, there's not exactly 1%, but this is just a sampling error of the, you know, that, just a randomness, okay? So everything working fine. But uh, what if, if you select the data, x equals large, x larger than two, then uh, p, uh, you know, the probability that the p is smaller than 1% is 42%, you know. That means, for example, if you have a publication on the nature, then if you specify 1% significance level, then only one of 100 papers would be wrong and then 99 papers would be correct. But uh, if you do such a kind of selection, then, then so 42% of, so 42 papers would be wrong. And 58 uh, papers may be correct. 
So that kind of thing happens. So this is inflated uh, significance. Okay, so what should we do is use the you know right uh, distribution, null distribution. So the, now we have we have a truncation here. So the correct distribution is like a truncated normal. So if you we use this normal uh, this distribution, then p value is maybe uh, p value is computed like this. Uh, you know this the numerator is the p value for the original problem, but uh, we divide you know this p value by this one. So this is the selection probability. So we have to divide the original ordinary p-value divided by this selection probability. So this is the adjustment. So this is very simple for this case. So if you recompute the p-value, for example, the case of x equals 3, then p-value become now about 5%. You know, it used to be 0.1% without the selection, uh, without the conditioning. Then uh, after this you know, uh, redefinition, the conditional type of error, uh, conditional distribution of p-value, you know, p-value conditioned on x is larger than c, you no, know, c may be two in this example, then this becomes uniform, so like this. And the type of conditional type of error becomes 1% now, so everything fine, okay? So this is what I mentioned. So we need that kind of conditioning. So this example is extremely easy. So uh, we got the answer immediately. But uh, for more complicated problems, uh, this adjustment becomes more uh, you know, uh, difficult. So for example, uh, this is a hierarchical clustering. Uh, this is a computed from the lung cancer microarray data. So people use clustering you know, hyper clustering, then you may get these clusters, okay? Then we would like to compute the significance of each of these clusters. So people do this uh, by bootstrap, you know, kind of resampling method. And then I have shown uh, three <laughs> types of p-value. So BP, this green one, for example, 67% means this cluster is, uh, you know, the confidence level is kind of 67. So if this is, uh, say, for example, 100% here, then we are quite sure. But uh, 67, maybe, you know, I don't know, <laughs> not quite high enough. And then if we do a kind of adjustment for the, you know, kind of multiplicity, then that is called the, uh, you know, the, by the method of multi scale bootstrap, which I will be uh, talk about, uh, then the p-value becomes 94%. So, but uh, actually this is, you know, I have defined two types of the, uh, such kind of multiplicity adjustment one. Then this red one is uh, computed without the selective inference. So this is part of the numerator part of the p-value, okay, numerator part, I mean. So the red one is only this part, okay. And then, but uh, for the selective inference, I have to adjust this one, this by, divided by selection probability. And then this is a, a blue one. So blue one becomes, this is 79%, okay? So all these values are kind of different. So we have to be careful about that kind of thing. And then uh, for the hypothesis, like this part, so all these are, uh, cells, uh, these are non-cancer. Uh, these guys don't have cancer. So these are normal cells. Then we expect that, that they are forming a cluster before we do you know, data analysis. Okay, so we may set the null hypothesis like uh, these guys are becoming a cluster, okay? Then it's okay to apply the testing without uh, selective inference, selection. So then we may use uh, these red values, you know, this everything 100 here, so there's a no distinction, but uh, so red value. But uh, for the case like uh, this guy, this cluster, we found that after uh, that analysis, we never tried to uh, make some hypothesis 
like these guys become a cluster before we apply hyper clustering to data set. So we form this hypothesis after looking at the data. So, so after looking at data, we may set up this hypothesis and then apply uh, you know, computation method to p-value for here. So this is a kind of cheating. <laughs> okay, so we needed to do you know, adjustment of selection for this guy. Okay. So there are two steps of uh, data correction. So first is, uh, you know, this is a kind of green one is the original uh, booster probability. This is a naive uh, confidence level. Uh, first, we have to adjust a uh, kind of multiplicity, one type of multiplicity here. And then next we do conditioning. So these are two steps. So it's uh, kind of complicated. This is another example. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the variable selection. So in this example, we had uh, eight variables. I, I forgot what those eight variables are. And then we applied the lasso. Then we got this six variables out of eight variables. So we throw away two variables. Then for those six guys, we computed the confidence uh, intervals. Okay, so confi computing confidence intervals is equivalent to applying, you know, hypothesis testing. So we have a same issue as I mentioned. So here, black ones are original, uh, non, you know, no adjusted confidence interval. And then the other guys are adjusted ones. Then you see the adjusted ones becoming longer. That means, you know, we, the, in other words, the, the, uh, uh, the black one, the no adjusted one is too short than expected. Okay, there are many uh, methods. So they may compute a different uh, confidence intervals. So this green one is too long. So then blue one is the improved one, and you know, then becomes a shorter, uh, still longer than black, of course. And then this red one is our method. This the, our method is very general, so not specific to the clustering, but the method can be used any problem. So just we have use our method to this problem, then compute it. You know, the result is almost same as blue one in this example. Okay. So now, well, I'm very slow to say, but I have uh, actually 100 pages of the slide, but <laughs> I will skip most of that. So now uh, I am very slow on this. So now I would like to explain the pro problem and setup and the goal, what we would like to solve with some steps, okay? So at first I may look at the very simplest case. So just to think about that we have a, data vector of m plus one dimension, like uh, say 100 dimension. So this is a data vector. And then we assume that y is distributed as a multivariate normal with mean vector mu and then variance and then covariance variable uh, matrix is identity. And then of course uh, in the clustering data or uh, you know uh, any other data maybe not distributed like that but uh, for the moment for the theory uh, i just uh, assume this simple setup and then that so this is a data point so we only got this one point and then the null hypothesis here is this uh, region okay i said h and then and then so our null hypothesis is that is like uh, this unknown mu is included in this region. So, so this is a null hypothesis. I would like to test this null hypothesis against alternative hypothesis that mu is outside of H. Okay, so this is very simple. And so this is a generalization of what I mentioned in the very simple one dimensional example. But now this region is uh, any, any shape and then dimension is any dimension. And if y is uh, very far from this region, then we would reject this null hypothesis. And then if y is very close or even inside of this region, then we may not be able to disreach uh, the null hypothesis. Okay, so this is a simplest setup. But in many problems, uh, we have a many, many hypotheses at the same time. <clears throat> uh, for example, the clustering case, we have, a. a many, many hypotheses. So each cluster is a kind of 
hypothesis region. So if we have uh, say 70 you know, items for hacker clustering, then the number of null hypothesis is the number of subsets, so two to 70. So it's, uh, I don't know, too, too many hypotheses. Okay, so we have uh, many, many hypotheses, and then some of them are maybe overlapped, uh, some of them are not overlapped, disjoint. Uh, okay, so we would like to test null hypothesis for each of them. So this is a kind of a real situation. So we may do several adjustments, whatever, but um, uh, so there are several approach to solve this issue, but uh, conditional we use, we uh, employ a conditional inference approach like this, okay? So in this setup, uh, we actually forget about uh, those many hypotheses, but uh, just uh, we may work on just one of them, that is allowed, uh, okay? So the problem becomes kind of simpler than controlling the many you know, type one errors simultaneously, okay? So, so only difference from the, this slides, this year here, that uh, we, uh, so this part is the same. So only difference is here. We are going to test this null hypothesis only when data point is included in this region S. Okay, so this is a selective region. This is a kind of uh, conditioning, you know, if part. So if Y is included in S, then I will try to test this region H, okay. So actually we have a many of these uh, S and the many of H. And then, so we do testing for each of them, but uh, in conditional inference, uh, we just look at only one of them. Okay. So, so this is more for, formal, formally, I mentioned the goal. So this, so I have been uh, saying about the uh, uh, setup, and then this is what I would like to uh, control, okay? So for non-selective inference, uh, this selective region is actually hold the space. So there has been no conditioning. Then the P, P value of this uh, hypothesis H, so just, this is my notation. This is a P value for H, is uh, distributed uh, as uh, you know, uniform between zero and one on, on the condition that the mu is on the boundary. So this is a kind of null hypothesis here. So this is a boundary. So for the case of the one dimensional case, uh, this uh, boundary is mu equals zero, okay? So, but the, for the high dimension, we have this becomes a surface you know, of the boundary surface of the region. So this is a non-selective case. So solving this problem is uh, kind of <laughs> difficult. So I have developed a multi-scale bootstrap for this actually problem. Um, so the difficulty of uh, this uh, problem is the capture of this region, okay? So if the, this, no, the surface, you know, this boundary surface is flat, okay? Then actually, then we can forget about the, forget about the high dimension. Then we only think about this direction, one dimension. So only one dimensional, you know, simple example may apply. But uh, actually, we the boundary surface is like a curved. Then this curvature is kind of related to multiplicity of testing. Uh, for example, because the, you know, in a simple hypothesis the region may be divided into two, you know, by one surface, one, one hyperplane, okay? But if you, if you have a two, two condition, then we have a intersection of these two hyperplane. And if you have a many condition, many those conditions, then we have a intersections of those many hyperplanes, then it's, it's not a smooth, but it's kind of curved, okay? It's a kind of polyhedral region, polyhedral, polyhedral. Um, then we need a kind of select uh, multiplicity adjustment. So much scale booster method actually developed to adjust this curvature. But uh, so I have developed this a long time ago, but uh, recently I extended, uh, generalized that method for this conditional inference. In conditional inference, uh, you know, we introduce this conditioning. So we only test uh, this null hypothesis only when y is included in S. So just I put this condition. Then on, 
so this conditional distribution, I, you know, should be uniform. So this is what I would like to have. So then computation of this P becomes, of course, different. Okay. So let, let me show uh, some examples of those uh, problem of regions. So everything is kind of region. So this is a, a, a phylogenic tree uh, computed from DNA sequence data. So, you know, so these are kind of species and then these are booster probability. So this is a kind of confidence. Okay, so this is uh, interpreted like, uh, you know, we have a data space and then each region here may be corresponding to, you know, some cluster uh, appears or, uh, or here I first they define that each region corresponding to each region is corresponding to tree. Okay, so this particular tree shape is a kind of region. Okay, so there are, you know, millions of these shapes. So there are millions of regions overlapped, for example, this region and then this region overlap. Okay. And then some intersection part may be corresponding to, you know, for example, this cluster or something like that. So each tree or each uh, cluster, uh, everything is kind of region in the data space. So this is a kind of problem of regions. Uh, for the variable selection in the same, okay? So kind of data space, or actually this is a, I said data space, but this is also uh, interpreted as a parameter space, okay? So you have computed the uh, parameter. Uh, this mu hat is actually, I forgot, ah, just here, uh, beta zero, first, you know, beta zero is ignored. I mean, just a subtract the means for the y and the x, so we can forget about the beta zero. So, so the regression coefficients is summarized as beta one and beta two, so only two dimension. So, you know, everything is drawn in a two dimension space. So, you know, data point is kind of summarized in this you know, parameter space. Uh, it's a kind of sufficient statistics. Then, so each region here corresponding to the, you know, model selection. So here, uh, this model is selected. And then this, these two regions corresponding to this linear model, and then the outside is corresponding to this quadratic model. So model selection is also the problem of regions. And uh, this is a kind of uh, multiple comparison uh, problem. Uh, here, the, uh, uh, later I may talk about this example. This is a phylogeny, uh, you know, uh, tree, you know, tree of you know life. Uh, that that is problem. So we have we may compute a score, actually likelihood value for each trees, and then choose the tree with the highest likelihood value. So it's the same as a model selection, and then so we may compare the likelihood value of these models. Um, so but we have uh, many models. So this is kind of multiple comparison. So we may compare, you know we may adjust the multiplicity of testing because uh, this is the tree of highest likelihood value. And then, so if you subtract this guy and then this guy, so this is a difference, then this is not just actually the difference of two likelihood, but actually this is a kind of maximum of these differences because we compared each tree with the maximum value of those whole likelihood. So we need to adjust this multiplicity. So this is actually, uh, the thing I mentioned, okay? So each comparison corresponding to the uh, flat surface and then dividing the whole region into two by the, you know, flat, so half space, okay? But we have um, taken the maximum of that. So this is corresponding to intersection of this half space. So this becomes uh, actually, in this case, polyhedral complex cones like this. So, okay. So it, this is kind of curve, okay? So these are more simple case, smooth curves. So if the region is uh, curved like this, then we have to, you know, uh, do adjustment. So the, the theory of multi scale bootstrap, uh, the algorithm I will mention a little bit later, first I developed for this smooth surface case, uh, but uh, in reality, I often face this kind of non-smooth, boundary to, you know with singular point but still it looks like a uh, curve so i had to develop a kind of generalization of you know 
or this, you know, theory. So, you know, if this is a smooth surface, we do simply think about the uh, Taylor expansion of the boundary surface. Then we may think about, uh, you know, uh, mean curvature or that kind of classical uh, geometry, uh, uh, you know, values we can use. But uh, if this is not a smooth surface, then all those classical idea cannot be used. Then I had to develop uh, another theory, but uh, still uh, it works. So the method still works. Okay, so this is kind of too much now, but uh, okay, just I wanted to mention. Okay, this is another example of region. So this is the selective sets for uh, Lasso. Okay, so in Lasso, uh, you know, it, this is the same as model selection, uh, as I mentioned. Okay, so each region corresponds to the model. So this is a selecting model two here. Then this is a selecting up uh, six variables, mod selecting variable two. Here, selecting variable one and two. Here, selecting variable one, like that. Okay, so this is a, a model example of model selection by Lasso. Okay, in Lasso case, uh, people have been developed the methods, you know a lot. So people, you know, know this kind of thing. So this is a selective region in Lasso. So every, everybody knows here. Okay. okay. So now I would like to talk about uh, our method. So our approach is uh, called multi-scale bootstrap uh, in which we change the sample size or data size in the replication. Okay. So here the original data with sample size n, you know, so this could be something, anything. Uh, but uh, n is uh, like a uh, 30, for example. If if you have a uh, three, uh, you know, students in a classroom, and then computing, uh, you know, some grades, okay. So so and then trying to compute, uh, say, average or variance or whatever. Then in such a kind of example, n is just a 30. Okay, this is very easy. And then in bootstrap resampling, we generate this kind of simulated uh, data replication you know, replicated data by randomly picking up those elements, randomly copying, allowing uh, replication, okay? So, and then usually uh, this is N prime is the data size of this replication, okay? So N is original. So usually of course N prime becomes, uh, N prime equals N. So N prime also 30, uh, but of course we can change N, N prime to any value because this is a kind of just a in just a for loop in a program. So if you know you can change any prime to say 50 or five or whatever you like. Okay. But uh, still you use any prime equals n usually of course. And then the confidence value uh, by doing this method. Oh, okay, okay, and I forgot to say that. So and then keep doing this. Uh, procedure many times by using the pseudo random number, say 10,000 times, and then count the frequency how many times you observed the same result as before. For example, the clustering, uh, you know, you may got the 10,000 trees and then count how many times the same cluster appeared in that kind of 10,000 3, 10, trees. So very easy. Okay. So, so, so. For example, you may got the nine thousand uh, nine thousand trees with the same cluster with the original data. Then this becomes a ninety percent sure. Okay, so that probability called the booster probability is interpreted actually a uh, kind of Bayesian posterior probability under some flat prior. So we say that okay, this is a Bayesian. Okay. And then, uh, you know, as I said, we can change n prime. Usually, people do, you know, smaller n prime for faster computation, but uh, we don't intend that. And then our theory says that uh, n prime should be minus n. <laughs> it's very strange, but uh, if we compute the booster probability with negative sample size, then that gives frequency p value uh, adjusted uh, p value. Okay, so if the boundary surface is flat, then these two guys, Bayesian posterior probability and the frequency p value are equivalent. But if the surface, as I said, you know, boundary surface is curved, then they become uh, different. Then for frequencies, sense we should use minus n. So this is a theory. 
Of course, we cannot compute the minus n. So we compute the p-value, a uh, booster probability for several positive values, say 50 or 100, whatever. Then do extrapolation of those probability value to the minus n. Okay. So this is the algorithm, really easy. This method has been used quite a lot. Okay, so I'm happy about that. Okay, and then you see the values are kind of you know, different, as I said. So, you know, we should care about this kind of thing. Okay, and okay, this is okay. So, let me uh, talk about a little bit algorithm more. So, so, this is, as I said, this is a model. So why is it distributed as normal, normal, normally distributed with mean vector mu? And then bootstrap resample is modeled like this. So Y star is now bootstrap resample here, these blue guys uh, distributed around Y, okay? You know, the original data is distributed around uh, mu, okay? But we only have uh, this one point. We don't have, we don't know mu. So we know only Y. So we generate a data set around Y then we got the many Y stars, okay? Say maybe 10,000 y, y, y stars. And then count how many times Y stars are included in this region, okay? Like, like this. So this is a computation of booster probability. So this is, you know, if B is large enough, say like a 10,000, we interpret this as probability, okay? Now sigma squared is here, okay? So we may change sigma square variance to, uh, any value. So you, if you change any prime, that kind of equivalent to changing sigma squared. So, so original bootstrap should use sigma squared is equal one, but we may choose uh, use say 0 0.5. If you increase a number of samples twice, then that equivalent to half of the variance, something like that. So we may compute several of these guys and then extrapolate this guy to uh, sigma square equals minus one. Okay, that's our algorithm. Okay, but of course in reality, we do non-parametric bootstrap, you know, instead of those uh, normal distribution. Okay, then uh, we just assume that there is a kind of transformation for which, uh, you know, you know, some data distribution converting to, you know, normal distribution. So this is only approximation in reality, but just we pretend there exists such a kind of nonlinear transformation. And in the actual computation, we don't have to know this Fn. Then just we keep working on this, this part, non-parametric bootstrap. So computation is, you know, very easy anyway. Theory looks difficult, but computation is very easy. Okay, so this is the main result. Um, so this is looks uh, complicated, but uh, let me explain a little bit. So this part, okay, this part is a booster probability, as I said. Then first uh, use this inverse function of, you know, CDF, uh, tail probability. So this part is kind of Z, okay, Z value, we said. And then uh, strangely, we multiply sigma, that means square root of sigma squared. Then we, we define this guy and extrapolate this guy to sigma square, sigma square equals minus one. Then we got this guy. And then of course I apply this CDF again to this brings back to uh, p-value. P so this numerator part is the original multi scale bootstrap, which is a non-selective inference version of uh, adjusted p-value, okay. Okay, so this is a, 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 the extrapolation to minus n. That's what I mentioned. But now we would, we would like to compute, you know, also the selective inference. Then we have a now numerator part. So this looks also kind of complicated, but, uh, you know, this part is the uh, same as here. And then this part is uh, kind of booster probability for the selection probability. So we also need to adjust this selection probability. And then, you know, we have just proven that uh, this part, this denominator corresponding to a uh, kind of selection uh, probability adjusted uh, those, you know, curvature adjusted version of selection probability. Then this, you know, uh, fraction gives the selective inference version of p-value, okay. 
And if you compute that p value, then that controls this probability. Okay, so this is the conditional probability, you know. So p value uh, smaller than alpha, conditioned on y is included in the S, is alpha. So this is what we would like to have. So this is a type one, conditional type one error is equal to alpha. So without the conditioning, you know, the unselected selective inference version, non selective inference version of p is controlling this guy. So without conditioning, you know, this controls type one error. So we have now have two versions. Okay, so let us see our uh, examples. Okay, so, uh, so, you know, there are many p values. So just look at this, this particular cluster. Okay, so the data size was, data, data size was about 900. Then I specified n prime to these uh, nine values somehow. Then, you know, sigma square is defined like this. Then the B was 10,000, okay. okay. I'll just forget this guy. Ah, okay, let, let me a little bit. Okay. So in this case, the, okay, let, let me explain this again. So in this case, this region corresponding to cluster, okay. So this region corresponding to, we found the particular cluster like, this guy. So now we are looking at this 50, this, this particular cluster. Okay. So now data point is inside of this region. That means we observe that cluster. Okay. So we test that cluster only when data point is inside of this region, because otherwise we don't observe that particular cluster. So we don't care that cluster. We never test it. Okay. So that now hypothesis we test here is that uh, mu is included in the complement set of this cluster. So the, that means the hypothesis region is a complement set of this S. So S is a selective set that is a cluster. So complement of so S. So that means this cluster is not true. Okay, so we test that narrow hypothesis condition that we observed Y inside S. Then if this uh, narrow hypothesis is rejected, we mean that that cluster is uh, kind of true, you know, <laughs> significantly true. So it's very strange setup. We use, in statistics, we don't usually do that kind of a thing, but we are now doing that. Okay. Okay. So, so this is a computation. Okay. So just forget about, uh, you know, details, but I look at, uh, so this uh, count, uh, count how many times we observed that particular cluster in the 10,000 simulation. So we have, uh, you, know, you know, different values for different uh, n prime values. Then converting this guy to first p value, just dividing this value by b, b is now 10,000, and then converting this value to this psi, then this is the plot of psi. So we have a theory that uh, this is almost uh, linear. <laughs> so we can prove that. And then, so actually we observe that. So this is almost linear. And then this is a sigma square. So this is psi. So just simply linear extrapolation, okay. But here we have used a little bit uh, improved version. So maybe I fit a, a quadratic curve here. And then extrapolate this guy to minus sigma squared minus one, then just read this value. So this is, uh, you know, what we want. And then applying this, applying the CDA function to this value, we get the p-value. So that's a computation. Uh, this is interpreted also like this. Uh, you know, as I said, this is almost linear. So this is a linear. So beta zero is, okay, this value is beta zero. And then beta one is this slope value. So in this particular example, beta zero is, uh, you know, kind of this value, you know, this particular value doesn't have, a, not really makes a meaning, but, uh, and the beta one hat is minus 0 0.5, you know, this is slope is this way. Okay. And so, but uh, interesting, uh, our theory says that uh, these two values has a geometrical meaning. And then this value is called a signed distance. And then this value is curvature. What this guy is, you know, sign of distance is a distance from boundary to this surface. And then the curvature is this guy. So the negative value means, you know, now hypothesis is outside. So looking from this side, 
curved, you know, you know, con kind of concave, okay. Concave is negative. If it's, it's convex, it is positive. Okay. And then, you know, this is, you know, if this mu, this y is on the boundary, the sign distance should be zero, but now it's kind of far from this boundary, then it, the value was kind of one. Okay. okay that's the interpretation. <clears throat> And okay, it's almost a time. <laughs> I want to go, uh, so I want to show example more, but uh, okay. But uh, this is a kind of theory, so important. So, you know, uh, in, mathemat in mathematical statistics theory, we have had that exact formula. Uh, so this is the booster probability. So if we change the scale uh, sigma to not to sigma squared, then the assigned distance is, you know, it's the same as rescaling the, this everything. Then uh, distance is scaled by this, and then curvature is scaled by this. So this is the uh, formula for the general booster probability. And then if we apply uh, that transformation, you know, as I said, then we go to this formula. Okay. So this is a kind of <laughs> proof. Then, okay, we change the uh, sigma, then we change like that. Then what means sigma scales minus one? So let me explain a little bit. So if we change the sigma scales minus one, that's intuitively flipping the curvature to the other way around. Then uh, if we change the sigma squares minus one, then beta zero plus beta one becomes beta zero minus beta one. Then we can also prove that the frequent p value is, is expressed like this. So this is a, a brief summary uh, why the mass scale booster adjusts the curvature, but uh, not yet the selective inference part. So you know, explaining why selective inference is that formula takes a little time, but uh, you know, selective inference computes the denominator part, okay? Okay, then for the selective inference, you know, computation is easy like this, then everything is almost uh, intuitive. Then we got the, the selective inference version of p-value. So it's computation it itself is very easy, okay? Then we have adjusted version, okay? So, you know, so this is the, it's almost a time and then I was just keeping up. So now I have shown a uh, PV class, a uh, higher clustering example, but everything is almost the same for the phylogeny. So this itself is also kind of long story, but uh, let me show only this example. This is a, a phylogeny of, uh, of mammals, okay? So we have a 15 hypothesis like that. So if we apply the original bootstrap, p-value is like that. So if we have a 5% threshold, only these two guys are not rejected. And these guys are rejected. And interestingly, you know, so the this tree is rabbit is closer to mass. This is a conventional tree. You know, biologists believe that this is true. This tree was rejected. And then this unusual tree was selected. And then this was actually once published in nature, uh, late 1990s, uh, because this is a new discovery for them. But later we found that this is wrong <laughs> because we have collected more data. Okay. And then, uh, so we have developed a safe method uh, which is, uh, you know, called a multiple comparison, you know, in all the statistics. Then we have comp recomputed the p-value. Then now confidence set of trees becomes like that. So this is safe. The true tree is now included. So this is safe. But uh, this is kind of conservative. So too many trees are included. So biologists are not happy about that. So, you know, if we apply the multi-scale booster I mentioned, so true tree is included here. Still, you know, the number of selected tree becomes smaller. So we are happy. So this is a kind of optimal, okay? So, you know, as I shown, the results are kind of different. Okay, so, well, this is a, maybe too much, but uh, we have computed the uh, regression, uh, the confidence, inter confidence, uh, confidence values for trees. Also, this is an example for the you know, lasso, as I mentioned. Then for the case of lasso, I have you know, explained already, but there are other types of you know, more complicated you know, version of lasso. It's not a lasso anymore. Then we cannot define these regions anymore, but we only have 
you know, got the result by just, uh, you know, computation, okay? So even in a kind of, you know, complicated selective region, you know, we can apply the method, of course, because we don't care about those in a particular case. We just count how many times we observe the result by simulation. Then we can, you know, compute, uh, you know, those p-values, uh, confidence intervals, not only for lasso, but for complicated one. Okay, so I have a bunch of theory, but <laughs> just I want to skip everything. Then it's almost a time, so now that's it. Thank you, uh, Shimo Daira Sensei. Um, um, so I, I guess there are some questions. I, I also had a question, maybe one or two quick questions. Um, one is related to uh, this p-value quantification. So we try to understand some uncertainty about some of the variables that we're picking. Have you considered maybe using some of the recent methodologies based on generative adversarial networks to try to maybe computationally uh, estimate some of these uh, posterior distributions to come up with some of these, uh, let's say, confidence bounds on the variables? It's, it's, it's uh, maybe slightly out of the presentation, but a, a bit related. Um, Could you say that again, which, which method do you use for the... So for uncertainty quantification, there are ways of uh, modeling distributions using uh, generative uh, adversarial I see, I see, I see, I see. So of course, if you have a specific model, you know, then based on that specific model, you know, built, then you could compute a built-in confidence value, sort of, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, then that is fine, but uh, well, that may not quite good if the model itself is not really real, you know, good approximation to the reality. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, or even you may have a situation like a hyper clustering, you don't have a built-in such a kind of confidence value. Okay. That means you have some method, okay? Then you got the data, then you feed the data to the method, then you got the result. You got just three or something like that, okay? Then right. in such a case, you know, we have a kind of external method to give validation to that uh, result. Then, so the booster probability, for example, gives that. So because that is a very simple simulation, you know, just uh, generate many data set and then compute, uh, apply the software, you know, <laughs> to that data set, you know, 10,000 times and then got the frequency. So very simple. So, so such a so, kind of, you know, have the generality we have, that means, okay. Mm. Uh, I think that this is an interesting point that mm. in, in this particular case, we mm. kind of lose this rigor and somehow certification that comes from this careful analysis and mm. uh, mathematical uh, approach. So um, uh, I think maybe some of these trade-offs uh, would be interesting to consider at least because at least in your multi-scale approaches, I really wonder how you would even attempt to do this with some of these uh, GANs and so on and so forth. The, the, <laughs> yes, the, the yes, second, of second, of course. Second yeah. question I, I had was again maybe something related. Uh, you know these works on uh, variable selection with knockoffs. Uh, yeah. I think Emmanuel Candes was uh, pushing this particular direction also quite a bit in terms of variable selection mm -hmm. did you did you have any comments on this okay um, that's a nice point well you know so when naively applying the bootstrap to the case of gang of course may not be possible of course but uh you know for example you know variational autoencoder for example uh mm -hmm. you have a internal representation you know you know, this is the input, internal representation that is kind of normally distributed. Then you have a output. So in such a case that uh, you don't have to fit the data many times here, you know, but uh, you have an internal representation on which you, you know, literally you assume that that is normally distributed. Then mm. in that space, you can play with this kind of thing. And then, so you don't have to refit in the those whole neural networks many times maybe just a fit the data once and then play you know in that uh, you know 
this internal representation. So that's very fast. That should be very fast. Oh, that's correct. That, that's a good point also. A, uh, any questions for uh, um, Shimodaira Sensei? I think there is one question. It, it would be great if you could write your question onto the Q&A. May I speak? Do you hear me? We hear you. Yeah. My question is that uh, uh, how much does the uh, argument depend on the normality assumptions? Mm -hmm. Actually, you see, the uh, same uh, probability distribution can be represented in different parameterization. And the parameterization, depending on the parameterization, confidence interval is different. Sure. So how does your uh, argument this today depend on the normality assumption? Ah, thank you very much. The theory itself is uh, heavily depend on the normal assumption, this model, you know. So if the, the why is not disputed like this, then we have to develop uh, another method. And then once I long time ago developed a method for exponential family, that's a generalization of this model, that is kind of equivalent to saying that uh, this I may depend on mu, you know? So this oh. in general, this because sigma, then sigma may depend on mu, oh. then things become very difficult, oh. okay? But, uh, you know, in a rough approximation, uh, around the true parameter, you know, if the data point is not very far from the true parameter, uh -huh. then uh, that sigma, in general, this is just a sigma, right? Uh, uh -huh. Sigma doesn't much different from the true sigma, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you may do, you know, just a linear transformation, whatever, to get the sigma equals identity, then so as a rough approximation, uh, you know, it's okay. And then, so first of all, well, of course you, you, the distribution is not exponential, exponential family or whatever, but uh, uh, often, it often the case that, for example, any maximum likelihood estimator is asymptotically normally distributed. So in anything, any setup, like, uh, you know, not necessarily uh, maximum likelihood decimator, but the most of the, those statistics is roughly distributed kind of no, normal, you know, and uh, some constraint and <laughs> concept. So, so just uh, I pretend that, you know. I see, I, I understand yes. your position. Yes, yes. and then <laughs> let, let me say that. So, yeah. you know, this, may, you know, and then, you know, even if the distribution is not really normal, then if we make some nonlinear transformation so that uh, cha changing, transforming this variable to another space, then if transformed variable is normally distributed, this wow. theory works. And then without knowing that F, that means that the method is very robust actually. So I experienced that uh, me you know, method I works very well, you know, even under, uh, you know, Non normal case. That's my experience. Mm. And another question is uh, I, I don't know the negative, ne negative uh, sample size case. Mm. Would you explain a little bit about the negative sample size case? Huh? Ah, negative sample size is only kind of theoretical. So uh -huh. we compute those p value for only positive sample size. For example, if n equals 30, and then how n do you pro estimate hmm? then? Hmm? So again? How do you estimate then from this positive sample size to? No, mm, yeah. we just specify. For example, if n equals 30, just I choose n prime equals say 50, 100, or 15. Uh -huh. Just I specify four values, okay? Whatever you like. Uh -huh. And then compute the booster probability for those four n primes. Okay. Uh -huh. Then, you know, using these four booster probability, you can uh -huh. extrapolate those probability to n prime uh, equals I minus see. n. You do that. I uh -huh. see. So it's not the estimation, but you just specify. 
I see. I see. Thank you very much for that point. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you for the question. Hey, can I also ask one question? So it, it's nice to have an asymptotic theory. So you had n to the power of three over two or something like that. Uh, yeah. That, that's great. But yeah. in practice, so, so I want to know your experience. So given some slightly more complex hypothesis, so is this theory still work with reasonable number of n? Hmm. It's uh, of course de depends, <laughs> of course. So I don't really apply this method for you know for the case of neural network or such a kind of you know you know extremely many parameters mm -hmm. and then extremely a lot of data. I don't know, but for the moderate case, you know classical status you know statistical setup, then it is you know okay. If for example n equals say like a hundred. And the number of uh, not necessarily you don't have uh, the parameters, but uh, in the case of uh, you know regression, if you have uh, say thirty variables, or then if you have a thousand n equals thousand, for example, then it works. Okay, but uh, if you have only you know you know thirty n equals just a thirty, then maybe it doesn't work well. Mm -hmm. yeah. ah, okay, thank you. That, 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 that's great news. Mm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Shimodaira Sensei. So this concludes our uh, session. Thank you very much. Okay. Have a great evening in Japan. And... <laughs> okay. See, see you sometime. <laughs>